Welcome to Responsible Chicken Breeding. My name's Karen, and I'm here with, well, nobody. Because Jim is in a plane right now on his way to Cameroon, Africa. So I did manage to hold him still earlier this week, though, and get him down to recording our stuff. So we do have a show for you today, and let's go ahead and get it started. Hey, Karen. Hey, what are How we doing are today? <laughs> I'm good, but, but uh, you know, as all of our lovely followers are tracking with us today and listening in on this live broadcast, I am somewhere 32, maybe 36,000 feet, either above, let's see, it's two o'clock in the afternoon. I'm probably somewhere over the Atlantic Ocean nearing the continent of Africa as we are live today. We should have picked an African bird to go. Well, you know what? There, Believe it or not, and this is a little side dream of mine, there are no uh, birds in Africa that we have a written standard for. So we're actually, um, we're navigating and pioneering new breeds of poultry in Africa, and someday we get to uh, maybe write a standard of some of the breeds. We're going to teach responsible chicken breeding in Africa. That's why I'm headed there right now. All right. I'll let you talk about the corn. You need to go with me sometime. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a passport, and I don't want to get one. Yep. Well, you can get a passport. Have you been vaccinated? That's personal. No. Okay. Not All right. Just well, listen, I, I am really excited. What? I've got one scheduled. Oh, okay. <laughs> I am uh, the breed we're going to talk about today. Uh, the Cornish is uh, it's a bird that is um, very, very, it's profound. It's influential. And in many ways it's misunderstood because when it, whenever we talk about a Cornish, people think of a Cornish cross, which there are drastic differences. And so um, I'm excited for us to do the breed of the week, uh, this segment and talking about Cornish. So jump in, tell us a little bit about you. You've been really intrigued by a bunch of information you've been gathering as we prepare for today. Yeah, it's it's got a weird a weird start off in the APA, so. Well, let's uh, uh, let's share some of that. Oh yeah, look at uh -huh. these crazy photos. <laughs> so, tell us the, what what breeds the standard says that the Cornish is made up out of. Um, I well, you help me because I can't remember what the A seal is in there, and these are some old historical pictures. There, you got the A seal and the, and the Malay or yep. Malay, as people say, and the game chicken. So there were like what, three or four different breeds that were used to make the Cornish based on our history here. Yeah, that's what, these are the, the so the uh, black-breasted red uh, gamecock, the, and the seal and the Malay sort of went into the original Cornishes, and then the Shamu, Shamu? Shamu, yeah. Shamu, Japanese, they said, was the base of the white laced red. Yeah, white laced reds, yeah. Yeah, you're you're getting this. We're getting man. there. You're a, We're getting that's, there. That's, that's awesome. That's a lot of upright game birds that turn into a not so upright Cornish. Well, you actually do. You want a little bit of an upright to it. You don't want it to be completely level. But we'll talk about that as we jump in and do this. Uh, talk about the the Cornish today. So, oh yeah, look at all this. Kind of walk me through what you learned in all of this. Well, what do, you, what do we say? That the Cornish was admitted in 1893. So um, just the what's now known as the dark Cornish, right? That's correct. All right. Yeah. So they so were 1893. Admitted. This would be the first printing of yep. the 1894 APA standard. 
Yep. But when you go looking for it, like I did, you're not going to even find a Cornish because that wasn't the breed name. So <laughs> they no. were called Indian Games at that point, And the variety was called Cornish. Right. Um, yeah. So. Which is weird. But we changed that. But that's kind of the kind of the cool part of the history that we're talking about here. Yep. So 1900. Um, by that standard, they've moved out of the class they were in and uh, into the Oriental Games and Bantams class. Um, and the um, whites have now been admitted. So that that happened pretty fast. In 1900. And it is it is intriguing that, well, I'm kind of giving you a little prelude here, but it jumped around probably more in different classes more than any other breeds, but let's continue. All right. So 1905, they've uh, changed the name of the class to Oriental Games and Bantams. Um, <laughs> um, but they dropped the, so they basically are, over time, it seems like they're dropping the game out of the Cornish. Yeah. That seems to be, um, because the breed name also changed to just Indians. Yeah. So now they're the Cornish and White Indians. You do, you do still hear, and and I bet our listeners are familiar with this. You'll still see like a um, a Cornish game hen in the in the uh, in the marketplace and stores. Yeah. So there's been a little bit of history. Ah, let's hold on to the name. But anyways, that's interesting. So in 19 oh, let's see, in 1905, then oh, here's the picture, right? Yeah. So See, and and they have they have definitely developed, and 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 over the years. But you do see, you see the meat characteristics of this bird, and they are a little bit upright. You notice that? Yeah, 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 yeah. So then, what happens in nineteen ten? Well, some very exciting things. So now they've changed the class name again. Now that the game is out of the even the name of the class. Um, and 1909, they've added the white laced reds. Um, and with that, those birds get to have a different weight. They're a, a full pound lighter um, yeah. for all categories um, for the white laced reds. Um, yep. And they also, in this year, they upped the, they upped almost all of the breeds weights by a half a pound the cock stayed the same but all the other breeds all the other cockerel hen pullet all went up a half a pound yeah um, so, you know um, all this was going on and you and i were not even thought of no that is absolutely true actually our parents maybe our grandparents were very very young but anyways that's crazy all I'm these pretty crazy sure my grandparents didn't really have anything to do with the history of the cornish <laughs> Not entirely sure, but since I believe if we they did, been... if they did, I am honored that yeah. you were doing the Cornish, but I know they probably yeah. did. No. Neither did mine. Yeah, there you go. All right. And then so, in 1915. Yeah, they finally found a home. The Cornish get to live in the English class now, and that's where they still are. So now they have a name. <laughs> they have varieties that have stuck. And they have a class that they're in, yeah. um, but they still are messing around with the weights. So the, the you know, last time they didn't change the cock weight, but this time they went up a full pound to 10 pounds. Yeah. Um, and the hens, they had to give them another half a pound. So I'm not really sure if they were trying to encourage people to make them bigger or were they maybe fixing the fact well, that the probably what tended was going to be on. bigger. You know, weights weights are so incredibly important and i have very strong feelings about the necessity of weights and and probably what was going on here is is um they found that the bird could be a little bigger which be it would be a more productive in the sense of more meat but it was at a level where the bird could still naturally mate and do everything that it needed to do naturally. So, um, I, I, matter of fact, I'm sure that because those are the weights today, right? The 10 yep. and a half pound, 10 and a half on the, on the cock, eight and a half on the cockerels and then eight. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Other than 
other than it took till um 1938 was the first time i found that the um the weights have now standardized for all varieties so the buffs were added um uh. to the standard that's the last variety that was added um and the weights now those poor white laced reds that used to allowed to be a lot lighter have now had to bump up a long way to get to the to get to where they've now consolidated the weights for all four varieties right right yeah. right right yeah this is the first um uh what i would call non dual purpose breed this is strictly a meat chicken i mean it's not doesn't have any inclination of being a a, a dual purpose breed. And I'm sure most people know that. But what I want to elaborate and give you a little bit of history on this bird is this is not a cross. This is a, well, obviously it was a cross in the beginning with those four different breeds. But now the, um, the Cornish is a bird that is, uh, it's, it's, it can be bred. It can naturally breed. It doesn't, it isn't a hybrid like a Cornish cross. So uh, as Karen and I mentioned, that's in the, uh, it's been for many years, the, the, the colors that are recognized in the American Poultry Association in the, the standard of perfection are dark, dark Cornish, white Cornish, the white lace, red Cornish, and the buff Cornish. So let me give you a little bit more history. As we said, this bird was originally called the Indian game. And it was actually developed about 1820 by a gentleman by the name of Walter Gilbert. And he was in England. It was developed with a, a superior fighting chicken was used in, in developing the Cornish. By the way, you know, um, I, uh, where I live in, in the Appalachians in Southern West Virginia and very, very Eastern Kentucky, there's still quite a bit of this interest in fighting cocks and chickens and everyone. It's outlawed, but people say, oh, it's, um, it, we just breed them. We just breed them. But those are some of the same birds. Can I um, ask Jim? Are yeah. The Cornish, if you were breeding Cornish now, are they? How much of the game is left in them? Can you have? A, can you raise roosters together? Do they have to be single penned? I mean, are, are they? Have they moved more to the domestic side now? Yeah, way, way, way. That's a great question, Karen. But way, way more domesticated. And actually, you know, the um, you can raise multiple males together up, you know, to a certain age. And and remember, and part of our responsible chicken breeding is that I, I've said this that aggressive daddies produce aggressive sons and the same is true with cornish now obviously uh large fowl old english game chickens the males will still fight they're much more aggressive but it's not it's after all these generations what are we into almost 120 <laughs> years um the males are docile they're awesome they have okay. they can have great personality right. so i just wondered that yeah so in the appearance, you know, the the Cornish are a very close, close feathered bird and very little to no down underneath the feathers. And the, the feathers are short and they're quite narrow. Uh, and, and so the size of the bird can be very, very deceptive. And, and the close feathers cause one to expect them to be much lighter than they really are. And as we mentioned, the weights, but you know the 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 body of a of a Cornish is very muscular and very strong. You can see it in these pictures. Uh, they're strong in appearance, and and no other poultry, you know, uh, is more. This is a very very unique bird. They have wide skulls on them, uh, and and medium. Oh, just a medium length of the neck and short shanks or medium to short shanks and their legs are set far apart. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more uh, at the end of some pictures here, but their bodies, if they're viewed from the top, it's so cool. They have a heart shape, both the males and the females. 
I remember when I was uh, first learning how to judge and I was hanging out with some of the, the very best Cornish breeders. And they would say, look down on the bird, Jim. You'll see a heart shape. It's, very, <coughs> it's a very, very important part of the, uh, of the type of the bird. A couple of things that I want you to remember about this bird, just some practical things is, is uh, you know, due to this muscular body type that the bird has, you know, th these, these birds could be harvested at a, at a early age. Uh, and there's when they're small and tender and, and flavorful, but they actually are and I'm gonna come back to this, they're a slower growing bird. As I said, we still see this name of the Cornish game hens that are, that are in the marketplace. And, uh, but here's the thing, the problem, well, uh, let me also say this, this bird we're talking about and the pictures that you're seeing is the bird that we used in the early days to develop the Cornish cross the cornish cross or we you know we refer to it as a cornish game hen or a or a uh, 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 the hybrid the fast growing meat bird it actually oh yeah here's the here's the video the that lower left hand corner is these are cornish cross and these are birds that are 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 um, a lot less able to naturally mate uh, okay these are but these birds, which is 99.9% .9 of all the chicken that's consumed around the world, they started with Cornish, the APA standard breed of Cornish. And uh, they were crossed with a white Plymouth Rock chicken. And that's the bird that we now harvest at about six weeks of age. So let me give you a couple other details, you know. The Cornish have yellow skin. They lay a brown egg. And remember this, I tell people all the time, these Cornish are awesome, awesome birds. But if you wanted to start an egg producing flock, a Cornish is not what you'd want to use. They'll lay anywhere of about 60 to 70 eggs a year. That's not very many. And they like to eat. They like to eat. They have a pea comb. Remember I said that, you know, there's about nine different combs that are in the standard of perfection and they have what we call a pea comb. Now, let me also tell you this. They are slow growing. This is one of the things that disturb the, the, the uh, meat chicken forefathers, probably in the 30s and four, probably 30s, said this bird grows too slow. It grows too slow. Uh, let's speed it up through selective breeding, right? And crossing it with that Plymouth Rock because the original, and that, you know, they got it down to six weeks. Well, the original Cornish, they need, they're very slow growing. They need about 22 to 24 weeks before they are ready to be slaughtered. So they grow very, very slow. But that's not a bad thing. You've got to remember we live in a fast, food culture. And actually, you remember this, the longer a chicken is alive, the better it will taste, the better it will taste. So in its uh, original development, they were known to be slow growing meat chickens and they, and they continue to be very, very famous for like an F1 cross of, of a meat, meat production, um, meat bird. Now, let me mention a couple of quick faults here. One of the faults is off sometimes, especially in the exhibition world, the legs get too short. If you get too short of a leg on a Cornish, too short of a leg on a Cornish, they will have a very difficult time breeding. And, um, and so the standard says that they must be medium in length as far as the leg goes. Um, and the legs, uh, they should be far spread apart. Where's that picture, Karen, that white lace red? Can we now this is awesome. And Karen and I were talking about it before the show. If you look at that white lace red, 
in the upper left-hand corner here of the screen, you see her legs are far apart. That's actually when you are breeding, especially, well, on both sexes, but that female, when she's, her legs are spread apart, that enables her to be in a strong position when not only to grow out, but when the male is mating her, she's able to keep her position and we're able to fertilize. I mean, there's uh, to be able to be fertilized. And this gives her a position to really be strong and, and to be able to grow. If you put her legs too close together, it's not there's, good. There's a there's a pretty big difference between width of body of those two females. They're really. Oh, you're looking at the other. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, the one in the very far left corner. Correct. Yeah. 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 Now this is, I'll tell you this particular picture. I, um, this was in Australia and the, and the, the, uh, I, when I was there, when I saw these Cornish and I saw, you know, red, our standard as well as the, the, uh, Australian poultry standard, I'm like, no way. They were awesome. They fit the standard, but this was a young flock and you can see, He'd yet to done any selection. And so, Karen, it's very observant of you that that right, you know, the bird with the nice spread versus the bird in the upper left hand corner. Those are two birds that need to be selected based on with the body. And uh, so you also want to remember if you're a Cornish, if you want to breed Cornish, it is a chicken that if it has a crooked keel bone, you remember crooked keel bones, Karen? I've I've seen one or two. Yeah. <laughs> We'll say that for another day, but Karen really battled. We battled with some crooked keels in a couple of different breeds that we were working with in, in SPN. Another thing is the standard says the eye color should be pearl. Now, there's so much debate over this, and you can do some studying on it, but um, and, and the standard also tells us that the P comb should be clearly defined, and on the females, it's um what did you say, Karen? We were talking about a pre-show. Is you the the, um, the yeah in the, or in the early standards it actually allowed for an irregular pea comb. So later later years they've they took that out and specified that it should be a clear pea comb. But there's still a note on the females that although uh, it's not a disqualification if. So there's a little bit more leeway on the comb on the females that it's a defect still. It's still to be counted down for, but. Yeah. Yeah. So you also, you know, you notice now nah, you can't see it super good. And these are, these are two ideal, a male and a female male on the, uh, well, obviously the male's crowing. That really helps. Doesn't it, Karen? <laughs> I did have to email Jim and say, um, I can't tell the boys from the girls. You need to tell me who, <laughs> which is which. So now I'll it didn't help that. when you saw the crowing male. Yes, I, I was pretty confident on him. And then yeah. you told me about the lacing. But that lacing where the dark Cornish, the males don't quite have the lacing. That doesn't seem they to don't. hold true on the white, the white laced yeah. reds, the both breeds. Both. Yeah. So so and, and that is true. And that's why on on these dark Cornish, dark Cornish are the probably the most popular color in the United States. Really pretty. And, yeah. Oh, it's stunning. And this particular female on the right, the one that's not crowing, uh, <laughs> she is spectacular. And her lacing is very, very distinct. And go back, uh, those of you who have a real interest here, go back and read the color description uh, of the dark Cornish, and you'll see what it says about, about the lacing. You know, the big thing is, Karen, that I think breeders must remember more than anything else. I mean, it's all important, but the point that is often missed is that leg structure. You know, you, you, you pointed out, just how the uh, the weights have changed, yeah. and there, you know, it's it's um it's a big bird. It's a meaty bird. It's a it's a powerful bird, and and that leg structure is one of the most important qualities to watch when you're breeding these birds. The, and, uh, the standard reminded me a bit. 
how much it emphasized the keels and the legs. It reminded me a little bit of turkeys. Yeah, Where oh, it's exactly right. And the reason for that, I'm so glad you mentioned that. The reason for that, when you talk about a keel bone, that's the breast bone. You talk about the keel bone or uh, uh, um, on a Cornish or on a turkey, it's because it's a meat bird. If you took all the feathers off of a Cornish or all the feathers off of a turkey and you lay it on its back, the keel bone is what is most exposed. That's the first thing people look at. So, so we learned the value of a breastbone is that you don't want to lay out a, a, a carcass from a Cornish or from a turkey in a marketplace that has a crooked keel bone. It's just incredibly unattractive. So there's other, other things that play into that, but that's the big thing is, is um, the, the quality of the carcass when the bird is on the table and Being the legs ready. have to support the weight. That's exactly <laughs> right. So. That's exactly right. So I love the, uh, you know, again, we, we always are promoting and discussing these, the silhouette, the outline. And again, from this is a, a, a more current silhouette of the Cornish. If you go all the way back to the late 1800s or early 1900s, the bird still has an upright stance. You look in the current standard of perfection. The bird should not be level. When it's standing, it should be a little bit upright in its position. And so that's um that's that's pretty uh pretty important. So Karen, any other um you you've been awesome as we've talked about this breed. Uh you've really enjoyed the research and um and just kind of uh, reading some of the history on it. And is there anything else that comes to your mind that maybe we should address for, for people who are a part of our show? No, I, I did find it interesting that it started off having uh, a shape standard for the males and the females. And then somewhere in the 50s, now it just says shape, male and female. And I don't know that I've seen that for any other breeds where the they literally have the exact same shape standard, but I don't yeah, think that's I a, that's a great observation. I actually did not realize that, uh, until you mentioned that. So you're, uh, you're getting in, you're dialed into the specifics of the, the history of the standard of perfection. Very good. Yeah. I admit that I've ordered, uh, five more used standards because <laughs> I have some gaps. And hey, listen, I have I um, like reading them online. I want to turn the pages and see what it yeah. really says in my book. So I have almost every single one that was published, including the very first one that has no pictures. I cherish that little standard of perfection. Yeah, but you're not giving that up. So I have to go elsewhere. You do. You so, do. Yeah. But now that I know you're interested in filling <laughs> in the gaps, I'll uh, I'll try and do what I can to assist you. So. All right. I think that's hey, it. Listen, if you're thinking about Cornish, there's um we can have some fun with these, but remember they're not an egg layer, but they're and they're a very slow meat growing meat bird. So do you do you see them in the show in the shows? Um yeah, there's they go, you know, you gotta go to the big shows. You you won't see them a lot. You'll see a ton of Cornish bantams. And where I live, um, there's uh, there's ton of the Bantams that are in the shows. But a uh, Anthony Ashley in South Carolina, um, and I can name that's kind of drawing a blank on a few others. But there's some, some very very good Bantams. But the large fell, they're hard to come across, and is that's another reason why <coughs> we I say we've got it eat these birds to keep them alive. Uh, a Cornish is a meat chicken. They eat a lot of, they eat a lot of food. Yeah. So if you don't figure out and think creatively of how to get them back in the marketplace, you kind of need an endless bank account for your feed bill. But it's, uh, so it's not, not an easy one e either. Is it? It's, it takes a sort of somebody who knows what, I mean, that's not a beginner breeder. It's not, it's not. There's definitely a great, need 
for large fowl breeders of uh, of all colors of Cornish all across America. So I, uh, we, we need some good people to take on these breeding projects. All right. Well, thanks for pre-recording this for me. And I hope you have a great time in Africa and stay healthy. All right. I'll be back on the 19th. the breeder we're here with matt hammer of smoky buttes ranch we're here to learn more about him and his birds um hi karen doing? hey um what what do you breed you've got well <laughs> i've got five different uh birds that i work with i've got three breeds uh salmon favorels well summers and a breed called ermanettes and I also have two breed projects that I'm working with, uh, Smoky Blues and Red Ermanettes. Um, the, salmon, the Salmon Favorels is a breed I started with right out of the gate. I found them fairly intriguing based on some of their unique uh, features. Here, you've got, you sent me pictures. Let me go ahead and share those so that okay. people can see your beautiful birds. So, okay. So these are the Salmon Favorels that you were? Yep. Okay. And as you can see, they're a bird with uh, muff and beards. They're also a feathered footed bird. And uh, they have an extra toe, which comes out of their dorking origin. Um, I was intrigued from it with them, you know, based on their based on their unique looks. And also historically, they're they're a meat bird. They originated from uh, France and, you know, in the early 1900s were kind of the gourmet meat bird for the Paris restaurant business. And so, uh, that was, that was really intriguing to me. Um, my second breed is the, is the well summers and, uh, <clears throat> the well summers intrigued me based on the dark Brown terracotta egg color and just that traditional kind of historic, uh, look the well summer rooster was the Kellogg's cornflakes rooster. And uh, that's a pretty good picture of this guy. He's pretty proud and strutting his stuff. Looks like you might like multicolored birds. Well, <laughs> I'm drawn to the unique and the unusual. And so definitely. And, you know, it's like there are also breeding challenges that are presented with these breeds. Yeah. That we can get into a little later, but I yeah. seem to I seem to enjoy a challenge. <laughs> so the next breed is uh, well, or the Ermanettes. And this is a breed that uh, a lot of folks aren't necessarily going to be familiar with. Um, it came into the United States in the, around 1900. It's a very unique colored bird that comes from a uh, co-dominance. Uh, the ability to lay that uh, those black feathers over a white base is uh, really unique in the chicken world. And these things got... Uh, messed around and people got really excited about this color pattern and crossed them with all bunch of stuff and kind of lost the the basic uh breed and uh it was thought to be extinct for about 50 years and then uh a gentleman by the name of ron nelson found examples of this breed in wisconsin about i don't know 10 12 years ago and started to bring it back so this is a recovery project that i've been working on for about seven years and has been really uh, interesting, fun, and a rewarding project to uh, to work on. They're gorgeous, and I this isn't part of the questions that I'm supposed to be asking you, but do they breed? I mean, do, do all the offspring look like that, or is it more of a splash where they do a 50, 25, 25? They breed like the blues breed. So yeah. you breed two speckled birds and you get 25% solid yeah. white, 50% speckled, and 25% uh, solid black. Now, if you breed solid white to solid black, you get 100% speckled. But um, I'm not to the position where I can do that yet because we still don't really have that color pattern set. You can even see there's some variation in a couple of pullets that are in this picture. 
from one that has quite a bit of black in her to one that has a lot less. And uh, there's also a little bit of red and some other things in there that the solid white birds mask that color. So we're, uh, I'm hoping, you know, in a generation or two, we can, uh, I can do that. Um, people, people like to see all those speckled birds and they, they get a little frustrated when they get solid white, solid black birds out of the same hatch. So, yeah. And then my two breeding projects are both offshoots out of this Ermanette project. When I first started breeding these Ermanettes, um, I got these from Sand Hill Preservation in Iowa. And uh, by the time Ron had released them, uh, a lot of stuff had got crossed in and in it. And uh, so there was a blue gene that uh, showed up in this line. And when I was trying to find appropriately colored birds, I did a lot of test matings. And one of my test matings produced a solid blue cockerel that was absolutely gorgeous. And so I stashed him away. <laughs> He was too pretty to go to the freezer, and I didn't really know what to do with him. And so a uh, year or so later, I bred him with some solid black Ermanette pullets. And this is that typical blue pattern where 50% of the birds are blue. You can see a splash bird up there in the top of the picture, and there's a black bird in there. And uh, so I'm just I'm treating this as a breed and continuing to breed them. Um, they're fantastic egg layers. They lay a large dark brown egg and uh, have a pretty good meat carcass. And they're really, really pretty to look at. I was going to say, and they're very attractive. Yep. Yeah, and they <laughs> produce a, it's just a beautiful multicolored flock. Um, as you can see, I still don't have the blue set in terms of how dark or how light we need to be. And so that's uh, that's still part of, the, part of the process, but they are stunning birds and then the other offshoot is the a project is the red ermanette and while ron nelson was working on the original ermanettes he got the idea to create a red version and he started that and then uh of course he passed on abruptly and a lot of his uh a lot of his work kind of got interrupted but there are a few examples of this around and so just uh, a year ago, I collected uh, samples of birds from three different breeders, and I'm taking another recovery project on. And so this is uh, this is kind of year one output. Obviously, they're not entirely consistent yet, but it's basically that uh, that white base bird with uh, red flecks, red speckles over it. And so here's a couple of uh, pullets and a and a young cockerel out of the first kind of go round. Um, so this project's got a long ways to go. We're in generation two of what's probably a <laughs> five or six or seven generation, uh, working process, yeah. but yeah, good thing I'm crazy. <laughs> um, so, but I just felt like, and, and based on what I was able to find, there was not, you know, the, the genetic material, there was a lot of crossing. Um, it's probably a good thing to resurrect this if it was going to be resurrected because uh, stuff was starting to fade. Well, so I really appreciate you sharing those pictures because they are nice yeah. birds. And most I haven't seen most of those before. So, Well, three of those are very unique and rare. Two of them probably don't even qualify as breeds. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, I got a pretty colorful bunch out here on the farm. Looks like a lot of single combs going on there. Where are you located in the country? You know, I'm located in Lindsborg, which is a very central Kansas. Um, I do all those birds are shingle combs, although the red ermanettes, there are some uh, rose comb birds in that in that population that I am going to perpetuate and keep going. Um, but so I'm it does get <laughs> it does get cold out here. We we are kind of right on the edge of the Great Plains and. We get both extremes. Um, we had that stretch of winter here that we went 13 days without it getting above freezing and had one morning where it was 16 below. And that's tough on combs, although you know, I keep all my breeders protected now 
from the cold weather. And then of course, on the other extreme, you know, we average 11 or 12 days a year over hundred degrees. And so, uh, got it all. Yep. By cool weather breeds like salmon favorels really don't like that. And they pretty much quit laying when it hits about 90. So, uh, all these birds out here are tested <laughs> for both <laughs> extremes. They have to be pretty tough to, to get through this. Um, how, I heard of seven years in there. How long have you been breeding? Seven years is, is probably a good, I bought my first chickens in 2012, um, and started playing with them, I guess. I wouldn't call it breeding, although I might've thought it was breeding. As it turned out, I was mostly goofing around, but I probably got serious and got some instruction starting in and around 2014. So yeah, but that's, it's 2021 now. So, so seven years, <laughs> it's been a while. Um, it feels longer than that for some reason, but what, what made you start breeding chickens? And well, like I said, um, in 2012, I got this idea that it would be really cool to kind of start a sustainable kind of chicken hobby operation with the idea that I would be raising my own eggs and some really good uh, meat. And that was kind of my, my entree into this. Um, I decided to become a breeder after I raised out my first batch of hatchery stock and realized this is not good heritage chicken meat. This is not what uh, was described. Um, <laughs> when you, when you look at, breed standards and, and some of the historic uh, production qualities. And I was really disappointed. Um, the first time I took the feathers off one of my well summer cockerels, I thought I'd cleaned a road runner uh, <laughs> rather than a, the plump chicken that they described in the, in the hatchery catalog. And so I'm like, okay, if I'm going to do this, I need to, uh, I, I got a lot to learn. And so that's, uh, that's when I decided to take the plunge and just, and uh, that feels very familiar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well you must like it cause you're still doing it. So is it rewarding? What's your favorite part? It's a, of it's a disease <laughs> <laughs> and there's so no cure yeah. <laughs> that I know of. And so, um, I don't know. I think a lot of people drop out. I think there's quite a few people who think they're going to breed and then they're no, they're nowhere to be seen in three or four years. So I think you are gotta, right. It's gotta, you know, catch, it's gotta catch something in you. I think it, it's gotta be rooted deep enough that you can withstand some adversity mm -hmm. because things aren't always going to go the way you planned and predators or disease or things can come and, you know, dead birds break your heart. <laughs> We've all experienced it. And so, you, you know, there's a certain amount of resilience that you got to be able, willing to kind of endure to do this because you can, you can show good progress and then you feel like you're going backwards and you think you got this figured out and then you do something really dumb and wonder, I can't fire myself, but I certainly deserve it. And so, yeah, it's got its ups and downs, but I really, you know, hatch days are amazing. <laughs> Most it's, of them anyway. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, true. I mean, not that there aren't disappointments there too, but just the, just the anticipation of baby chicks hatching and, you know, getting them started on their journey is, is one of the rewarding kind of things about breeding and, uh, you know, kind of the next thing is, and we'll get into this, but that so getting the birds up on the selection table at, in my case, it's at 16 weeks and it's kind of that culmination of a year's worth of work and what, what, what have we accomplished? And of course it's not always positive. Some, some of those times are disappointing, but the, again, it's the anticipation of okay, here's the, this is the output of this year's worth of planning and work. And, and, uh, oftentimes, and fortunately more times than not, there's some really good news that comes with that. And some, you, you know, you 
you see a bird and you're just like, oh, wow, that's, that's what I've been shooting for. And so, and I also just get a lot of satisfaction from walking through my pens and watching these birds, you know, most of these breeds now after, uh, you know, the, the Faverelles and the Well Summers and the Ermanettes have all been about seven, I'm about seven years into these things. And so they're to a point where I'm proud of them. And that's, they, that's a good that's a good place to be <laughs> i mean they're not finished yeah they're not perfect but boy I, you know and they're not all i did you know they're not clones of one another so but there's birds in there that i walk by and are just like oh wow i did that well, and <laughs> that's pretty I think, rewarding i think everybody would say a genuine love of the birds themselves is really crucial to put in the work you know in order yeah. to motivate you to so enjoying them being able to go out and actually enjoy them is, is and, and, good you know reap the rewards yeah yeah knowing what the plan is and knowing what you know that bird's supposed to look like and then actually seeing it you know you're just like oh okay <laughs> this is working um i heard you say seven years ago you got a little help and got a little bit more serious was there any breeder or mentor that helped along the way <laughs> i've had two mentors that i really or two two people that i really consider integral to my kind of education and seven years ago i was introduced to jim adkins and uh, i've heard of him you've yeah. heard of that guy I've yeah heard of him. he's a little crazy but it's chicken crazy and so um we fit we, we headed off and one of my first kind of breeder exercises was joining him for a 40 hour uh, chicken school and i learned a ton just the fundamentals of of breeding and i was ready i had birds on the property um i was already fooling around with two breeds and soon to add a third and so i was breaking most of the rules by starting too fast anyway but uh he was he was a great help in terms of uh, getting me off the ground and and turning this from kind of me, you know, groping around in the dark to <laughs> actually having a plan and and a, a basic understanding of what I was trying to accomplish, and then uh, my second mentor is is Kurt Burrows, and Kurt is a breeder from uh, Iowa who had an integral role in kind of rejuvenating the Iowa Blue uh, breed. And Kurt's strength really is an incredible understanding of poultry genetics. And my Ermanette project in particular with the, with the complication of that color and, and things of that and kind of building a breed from the ground up, he has been a really integral uh, component of kind of the next level of my education. And I'm more mechanical and I can hatch chicks and raise them out and do selection kind of based on data and such. And some of that, uh, understanding of the intricacies of genetics is not necessarily my strong suit. And Kurt's been a, a lot of help to me and an enthusiastic supporter. And he also raises Ermanettes. So he's kind of switched gears from, from the Iowa blues to the Ermanettes. So him and I have been really working hand in hand, kind of building this breed back. So those are the two folks that have really had a lot of, you know, influence in my. Uh, I was lucky enough for one call with Kurt so far to discuss the ins and outs of feather quality with my Rhode Island Reds. That just a difference, a major difference in feather quality between my Australorps and my Rhode Island Reds that he helped me understand a little better. So that was nice. I get on the phone with Kurt and it's an hour. <laughs> That's okay. We, we get talking <laughs> yeah. birds and yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. Um, so it sounds like you're, you're pretty serious about this. I mean, you're, you're not a casual hobbyist, are you <laughs> at this point? I consider it a serious hobby. Okay. Um, it's still a hobby. It's not a business for me. Okay. Um, there, you know, a, a lot of the things I undertake aren't, they don't make financial sense. So <laughs> it's not a business, but I do take it seriously. Uh, I take I take heritage poultry seriously. I think it's a it's a resource that um, needs to be 
preserved and, and in order to be preserved it's got to be you know kind of built back and it is part of our history and it's an integral part and these you know done the right way these things are birds are productive and gorgeous and uh are interesting and so i it's it's part of how i'm wired um my wife is like you started this i thought you were talking about just having a few chickens around the house and i'm like well maybe i thought of that too but it's evolved it's become more and, important than than just the yeah minute, and it's it? yeah. well and i have to have a purpose and so once i got once i got the bug um yeah i just felt like i had to it's like okay if i'm going to do this i have to do it well mm. and if i'm going to do it well i have to learn what i'm doing and so yeah i uh i spend a lot of time you know building a hatch plan every year and um working through kind of my breeding goals and kind of organizing, you know, what the year is going to look like. And I enjoy all of it and try to do, you know, the best that I can. Well, I'm afraid to even ask this, but is there uh, any breeds that you think you might want to get into still? <laughs> <laughs> Since Your I'm working with not listening, yeah. you're right. <laughs> Since I'm working with five already, you you kind of might have a sense of this question. Um, it's most of them. Um, you know, one that's really caught my eye is the French breast. Um, it's another meat bird. Um, it's a it's a solid white bird. That's the current rage in Paris, France, is the meat bird. Uh, it's a white bird with blue legs, and uh, it's supposed to be an incredible meat bird. Um, but I don't have room. I've got five projects going on. And so in order to add anything, I got to subtract something. And that has been really difficult for me, but I really like these birds and my, probably my, my number one intrigue, I guess, is I consider heritage chicken meat to be gourmet quality and outstanding. And so you know, my well summers are, are kind of an egg first breed, but everything else I'm breeding um, is either meat first or really balanced dual purpose. And all those birds are, are I don't know, her heritage chicken is phenomenal. And I, uh, I love it. And I just think it's, a, it's comparable to a good steak in terms of uh, my palate and things that I enjoy to eat. So just about any one of these birds that's rare, unique, endangered, and tastes good. And edible, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, what, what, what clubs do you belong to? Are you, are you big in joining? <laughs> I'm not a big joiner. Okay. Um, but. I'm a big joiner. I'll admit it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I am active with the American, American Pasture Poultry Producers Group, the, the, the name that's hard to say, yeah. uh, the APA Papa. Yeah. Um, and the obviously, Appa. you and I are, are, uh, are helping produce some webinars through them. And just it's the idea of teaching folks about heritage poultry and, and breeding to kind of perpetuate the whole, uh, this fancy, I guess you would call it. Um, but it, while I work with them, I'm also a member of the AP, APA. God, I'm going to stumble through this. <laughs> APA. I'm a member of a Favreau's Breed Club. I'm a member of the Wellsummer Breed Club. Um, I am a member or a participant with the SPPA, the Society for the Perpetuation yeah. of Poultry Antiquities. Uh, poultry. Yeah, something close that close. Not yeah. <laughs> yeah, a preservation of poultry preservation. antiquities. Yeah. And then, uh, well, then I support, I, I definitely am a supporter of the Livestock Conservancy. Yeah. And so the APAPA, APAPA, whatever you want to say that, I'm active with the, the rest of those organizations I support, but I'm not necessarily uh, an active member within, within those groups. Yep, I can say basically the same, although I am not a member of the Favorel Club. 
Yeah. Right. <laughs> so no need for you to be at, at Rhode Island Red Club, and yeah, you're looking the same. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, do you? So, based on the groups that you're a part of, I have a feeling that you consider production qualities to be important in your birds. You know, it's back to that whole my love of history and kind of why were these birds created? Why were they important? Why were they significant? back in the day and a lot of that is the production and so it never really appealed to me to raise and I, I have nothing against people that raise birds to show but that did not having the prettiest bird in the pen or, or whatever I don't want to I don't want to denigrate what they do um, but yeah production qualities it's kind of back to my my roots on the farm and you know being out on the farm back in the day with my grandfather and it's like I, I love the concept that they have to earn their keep so on your breeds that are in the apa standard you're you are breeding to the state you are breeding to the standard right so you're looking right. for a productive bird by using the standard right you don't think they're mutually exclusive like you can have a productive bird or you can have a bird bred to the standard can you do both <laughs> i think well a lot of the historic breeds that were, you know, breeds considered heritage were, well, most of them were introduced into the standard back while they were still productive birds. And I think the bird described in the standard for the most part is a productive bird. And you, you know, I've also uh, believe in understanding the history of the birds. And when you go back to the histories, you get a lot of that production information is kind of what that bird was capable when it was, being employed on the farm every day to do that. Um, now there are some show components to the standard. And so both of the birds that I selected, my Favorels and the Well Summers are considered dual bred birds. The standard is written in such a manner that um, you can't get the appropriate color of both males and females out of the same breeding pen. And I, frankly consider that a flaw in the standard of those birds and so I have to make a decision as to which direction I'm going to go whether I'm going to breed towards the you know have a male line or a female line and in both cases I've opted to lean in the direction of the female lines and breeding females uh, part of it is just I think it's easier um, but anyway I can get the production quality out of them via the standard and then I breed, I tend to breed towards producing females that look closest to the standards more so than, than males that look closest to the standards. But in both cases, I tread that line a little bit. With all your breeds and all your projects, you must have a lot of space. So how many breeders of each do you, do you keep roughly not exact numbers? Cause we don't tell our, you don't want to tell your wife exact numbers. So yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, I run, I try to keep around 25 breeding females per breed. And so that's two substantial breeding pens in with the case of the Ermanettes, I'm up to four breeding pens. So I've got probably closer to 75 adult birds, breeders, you know, plus, plus males in, in each breed. But I think, uh, you, you gotta have enough to produce enough eggs to make, you know, yeah, race, so, you know, it's just breeding is about numbers in a lot of cases. Yeah, I was gonna say so, I, I'm 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 ready to ask how many chicks you must hatch out from of each breed each year because I'm, I'm <laughs> from your numbers I'm thinking it's pretty high. Yeah, <laughs> I try to breed out to hatch out 200 chicks per breed. To me, that gives me that you know I'm 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 seeing a hundred pullets and a hundred cockerels roughly. And so I'm that pullet class. I'm looking at the top 10 or 12 out of that hundred. And with the boys, I'm looking at the top three or four out of that hundred. And so, and if you take 200 times five, you end up with around a thousand chicks, which is a little crazy. Um, <laughs> admittedly last year I hatched, 2,300 chicks. Um, approximately 1,100 of those were my groups 
of mm -hmm. 200s that I used for my own breeding. And then the balance were basically chicks that I sold. Sometime, not this time, but you're going to have to come back and talk to us about how, how do you even raise that many and sure. select and, and cause it all happens around the same time. Do you do multiple little batches? Do you do, you know, do you try? So I don't want to talk about it now. Cause <laughs> I didn't well, I will say it's part of the reason why I have those large numbers so I can hatch decent sized batches. And then also a lot of my breeds are fairly similar in kind of type. And so I can raise them together and uh, slaughter, you know, take right, them, the take them to the slaughter, you know, have numbers that the slaughterhouse is interested in dealing with. And so, but yeah. yeah. Topic and then for and another then a day. A lot of freezers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so with that much, with that much, with that many to select from, with that many offspring each year, you must have been able to make some, you've made some improvements, right? Over, <laughs> over your years. I hope so. I mean, that's the, <laughs> but yeah. Um, you know, when you're starting with, with largely hatchery stock, um, you're, you're not necessarily starting at, at a great baseline. Um, if I'd have probably, you know, there are breeders out there that I could have bought chicks from and, and maybe got a better jump start. But um, I really feel like, you know, in this seven year, it probably took three or four years with my salmon Favarels to get a bird that matured to a, you know, a marketable meat carcass, I guess, or, or, you know, something that, you know, from those first birds that I got to, to actually having something that you could hold in your hand and go, this looks like something that someone would buy. This looks like something that I could feed my family and, and feel good about. And so, you know, that was, that was real progress. Um, you know, trying to get those birds, you know, they top out, actually, historically, they supposedly laid 215 eggs a year, but not in Kansas because <laughs> they take the summers off from laying. And so my birds have topped out about 160 eggs a year, but I do feel like in a Northern climate, kind of the Northern third of the United States, I think they could easily, my birds have the potential to get from 180 to 200 kind of genetically. And so, you know, those are, those are big steps up from where I, from where I started. Um, my well summers again, in the, they're better adapted to the heat. And so they don't quit quite as easily, but I'm well over 200 eggs a year um, with my well summers in their first, you know, their pullet year. And I've had pens go as high as 250. But uh, I think, again, some of that's environmental. You got to get the right weather for them to do that. You need a really mild summer and such. But, you know, so there, there's some variation there. But, but raising a bird that looks like a well summer and acts like a well summer and lays 200 plus really dark brown eggs a season is a, I consider that a worthy accomplishment. And uh, they forage great. Um, they're not a meat carcass, but, or they're not a meat first bird, but at 20 to 22 weeks, they are ready for the freezer as well. If, uh, if you well, so desire. Well, and you're approaching with those numbers in your, your egg production, you're approaching being financially viable for a small farm or a sustainable farm to be able to use versus a sex link or, you know what I mean? Like you're, you're approaching numbers, production numbers that you, I mean, you, you are, especially when you, you know, okay. If you're, if you're trying to make a business that was strictly egg laying, um, you're going to, you're probably going to fall short. But when you factor in, you know, the idea that, that, your, uh, your young males are, are a good quality meat bird. And because you're raising, raising a specific breed and, and maybe one that's interesting to others, you know, there's an opportunity to sell baby chicks this time of year. And when you can convert that, uh, $5 a dozen eggs into seven or eight $5 chicks, um, you know, that changes your financial dynamics significantly. So well, and and there is an opportunity there. And on the APA, or yeah, the other APA, <laughs> um, you know, groups, they talk about, you know, one 
one blue egg, one green egg, one dark speckled egg can sometimes raise the price of that dozen a little bit. So you, you know, if you can have an attractive egg, that's a, you know, a pull that maybe you don't do all well summers, but if you do, you know, I mean, you, you add that to their group for selling. <laughs> yeah. Back to your question about other breeds, yeah. you know, breeding actually Americanas or, you know, one of, one of the, uh, one of the colored egg layers and adding them to that. When I put together a dozen eggs, I've got the, the dark well summer eggs. I've got the light Favorel eggs and it is a pretty attractive contrast in a, in a package of a dozen eggs. And I do feel like it helps. I'm obviously missing blue or green eggs from that package. But, uh, um, if I was really going to run an egg based business, I might have to add a, a blue egg layer to the, to the mix to, uh, yeah. to do that. So, yeah. I, I understand completely what you're saying. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to ask you this last question and I'm going to let you get back to it because I'm guessing your days are pretty full. Do you have a specific breed that you're really looking to improve in a specific way? Just what do you want to tell us about your goals here? <laughs> let's say, let's call it the most important work to me that I'm doing is the work with the Erminette, the restoration of this kind of long extinct uh, never really established as a breed. The Erminette was never in the standard, but there are a lot of examples of it historically. Um, and so taking that kind of lost uh, genetic pool and turning it into, uh, you know, a viable population, a productive animal in its own right, they, they, these birds are incredible layers. And they, they actually, you know, they, they, they fatten out to where the, the males are ready for the freezer at 16 weeks. And so mm -hmm. that, that, you know, they, they really have the, the homestead dual purpose function. I bring them back on. They're so pretty. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> kind of, kind of nailed. Um, and so taking these birds, you know, kind of to potentially breed status, you know, we haven't, we haven't decided that that's really where we're going, but, if there's enough interest, we would certainly be, uh, be willing to, and then kind of, you know, we've just, just refining this bird and we've got to get this color pattern kind of set. Um, one of the things we're, we're working on as a breeding goal right now, and you can see it very well in that cockerel is he's pretty upright. And so we've got birds that are pretty upright in this group. That, that carriage and you see the slope on the breast and the slope on the back. And we've got birds like this pullet in front of us that are pretty level. And so, you know, we're still, you know, in terms of breeding goals, we're still trying to refine that and, and get that type set in terms of a body type. And then, you know, really dial in this color because there's a lot of variation. You can, you can still see that in the, the pullet in the front of the picture has a lot of black and probably a little too much for the standard we're working towards right now. And then the, the pullet behind her is probably doesn't have enough and it's not uniform enough. So there's, um, there's a lot of things going on with that breed. My, uh, my typical approach with, you know, with my well summers and Favarels was to, uh, really work on, you know, the building, the barn and worry about color later. <clears throat> Um, but with these birds are kind of the part of their uniqueness is they're color based. And so you can't lose track of the color, uh, while you build the, while you build the frame because you may never get it back and there aren't, you can't just go to another Erminette breeder and go buy some outcross candidates cause they don't exist. So, uh, we've really had to work to kind of retain this color and kind of build the, build the body on these birds appropriately and so it's been my biggest challenge and probably my most rewarding challenge and it's one of those things that i keep thinking i'm i've been two generations away for a couple of years now <laughs> and thinking things are going to get close but uh kurt keeps dreaming up things we need to work on so <laughs> that's that's helpful no <laughs> but in the meantime they're unique and interesting and people want them and so it's uh I have a lot of interest and a lot of orders, you know, in terms of, of selling chicks because uh, they're they're a gorgeous breed and, and people really like them. So it's been a really fun, rewarding project that I've 
And we had we had a question on one of our previous episodes about how do you breed a breed that isn't in the standard or doesn't have a standard. And um, it sounds like you guys tackled it by writing one or working on <laughs> like, but having exactly. a constant goal. I mean, I mean, like you're not just every bird is great and I love them all, you know, so. You know, and in, in, in breeding these birds, there's probably a half a dozen random directions we could have went. Um, one of the reasons I've got that dark speckled bird is I actually find it a little more eye appealing than what the original standard was. And I've got a few too many of them because my personal preference uh, has selected in that direction. And I need to kind of back, I need to back out of that. So um, we sat down and I drafted a standard, you know, based on what I, what I felt like the bird should look like. And I went through, I, you know, I, I went through the standard and adapted the format and kind of picked what, what, uh, you know, how this bird, you know, part of it is the bird will take you in the, in a natural direction, but, uh, at some point you got to kind of, uh, steer it as well. And so, we're, yeah, it's still a work in process, but we're, we're trying to get things narrowed down. But, uh, obviously there's a, there's a color pattern there that's important to get nailed down. And then, uh, that, that carriage and that body type is still things we're working on. So, but there is a draft standard, you know, that we're both working off of and we argue about it and, and kind of debate back and forth where, where these things should go or where they should be or, or and Kurt's a, a great one for finding old pictures of these birds in the archives and going, well, here's what they look <laughs> like in yeah. 1915. <laughs> so it's like, okay. Yeah, but how many of those old pictures agree on exactly how they look like? But that's they don't, don't agree. <laughs> that's one of the intriguing parts of the history of this bird. But because the, the cool thing about this bird, and it's and it's it's really tempting with this co-dominant color, and and one of the reasons why it never established as a breed is everybody wandered off and created Ermanette Wyandots and Ermanette Rocks, and and even now. Uh, one of my local guys crossed an Ermanette or I bought some Ermanette pullets and crossed it with a salmon Favreau rooster and created some Ermanette Favreau pullets that were stunning. So that's part and, of the problem is because they're, because that makes such an attractive bird, it makes people want to play with it instead of, instead of trying to keep it. Yeah. And so that's a, that's a temptation that I've had to resist in kind of carrying through this and not kind of drifting off course. <clears throat> and so. That's true. You have been rather, you have been rather like you have all your different breeds and you have a lot of them, but you're not out there making well summer Favorelles. And <laughs> I mean, yeah, when you have no. multiple breeds, it's always, it's, it's hard to, you know, resist sometimes making a farm, farm birds. <laughs> yeah. Right, exactly. And it, there's a lot of boutique kind of breeds out there or what you call breeds. And so, yeah, it's a little tough being disciplined. There's time for that later, but I got to get these things uh, set to where, um, and we got to get them established around the country. Yeah. yeah so you're not, you know, you're not constantly recruiting. You're looking for, you're looking for more breeders to join you if they're serious about. Yes, absolutely. Okay. You hear that, everybody? Um, and the name of your ranch, let's see, let's put that back up so everybody knows <laughs> that is the Smoky it's Buttes Smoky Ranch. Smoky Buttes Ranch and you in do have Lindsburg, a website, Kansas. Right? And you do have a and website. And I have a website that is SmokyButtesRanch.com, just the right. way it's spelled on the logo. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate you coming and talking to me for so long. It was a lot of fun, Karen, anytime. All right. Thanks. And I'm muted. Um, the, in case you can't guess, that was Matt, and he was pre-recorded. Um, he is serious about anybody who wants to doesn't isn't already overwhelmed with too many breeds of your own. Um, but if anybody wants to help out with the Ermanet project, he is. They are looking for um, responsible help. Um, the Meet the Breeder segment is something that you can apply for on your website. Matt was our. Uh, let me put Jim. Let me put Jim back up on there so I don't feel so lonely. Um, 
uh, on our website, you can apply to be. We are pre-recording most of them, unless I know you really well, just in case. Um, we want to be able to edit if needed. Um, and you do get questions ahead of time that you can choose from which ones you want to answer. So don't think that everybody has to answer all those ones that Matt did. Um, we'll probably do a few less next time because I learned my lesson there. Um, but in answer to, I want to bring, I want to bring up Nancy's question here. So she wants to know what are the, some of the common defects you see in the well summers. And that is something we always want to cover with our breed of the week. And Matt has actually agreed to come back next Monday and talk about the well summers specifically. So he'll be doing the breed of the week next week. And our, we're going to do our first mailbag segment. Um, we have a mailbag question about carcass weight versus live bird weight and um brant bullock is actually going to come on and answer that with a field trial he did back in 2015 so in order to make up for having one host this week we're going to have three people here for all of the live show next week so i appreciate y'all coming and sticking with us through this slightly different episode um and i hope we'll see you next time thanks so much see i gotta take this off Thank you so much. All right. Bye.